Thank you for braving the muddy, muddy roads to come here this evening. Um, it is such a deep privilege to be here uh, in this incredible company. Thank you, Diane, for um, holding this incredible event. And Diana and Mary Jane, my companions in, uh, in the word and the image. And um, I was really reluctant. I didn't say this the last time, but I was very reluctant to go to rehearsal. It was just like, oh, it's at night, and it's a long way. And it was such a wonderful experience. And we realized that all of our work had a connected thread of some aspect of healing to it. And so um, that, is, that was just a, a great surprise and truly delicious. So um, a full disclosure, uh, Mary Jane was my writing teacher in 1973. Uh, as she opened the door to so much, to a, to a writing life and to her own incredible work. And it's been just um, a wonder to be connected with her all these years. And I'm graced that she has ha having our writing class on Monday night, so um, for the month of April. So I've been writing for many years. Um, I started writing as a way to make sense of being physically different in the world, and the way that that felt like that could work was somehow putting words down about it. And it served well in later years as the bumps in the road arrived, and a um, fairly significant bump in uh, 1995, I just had a smorgasbord of illnesses and cancers, and uh, writing saved my behind. It really helped me make sense of what my experience was, and I got to reclaim the story as my story, as opposed to what I was being told I would do or what happened to me. And that then led to the luckiest job in the world, which is, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I teach a healing art and writing class for folks dealing with illness and their family members. and. Um, the stories and images that people create every week are astonishing, and, and uh, I just feel so graced to be uh, in their company. Um, it's sort of like they're the teachers, and maybe those of us that get older, we find that there's a lot of teachers in our lives. Um, so the first uh, several poems I'll read come from the earlier places of being different and uh, working through healing with cancer, and then the other poems will be um, Brandy New Work, and then I'll close with a memoir piece uh, that I'm working on about uh, myself and my mother. Marooned. The child is marooned on an island. She is there because of her face. It is an island in the middle of a family, a school, a neighborhood. The color on her chin and neck is somewhere between grape and royalty. Where she goes, the island goes. Her sisters whisper up against the shore. Her parents gesture and flap overhead. The cruel stones of boys clatter. No one touches her there except doctors and dentists. But then, there were dogs on the island, birds and worms and violets, a whole greenhouse full of carnations. The Nest. When cancer roared in, the careful nest of my life was blown from its tree, twigs scattered, threads of birch bark and horsehair and fungus, the breast feather lining strewn, one of two eggs broken, innocence like yolk running out. After the tests and the surgery, I had to rebuild it stick by stick, ask, how did this nest hold together? How can it safely cup one oval breast left? It is lonely, cells and skin insecure of their symmetry. It sits in the new woven bowl, gratitude like spider silk, braided in with fear, tenacious and invisible. So fast forward to this um, face of distinction more recently. Even ground. Lately, when someone snags on my face, especially a grown-up, and they cannot refrain from sneaking a glance at such marks, the barest whites of their eyes showing like a spooked cow that doesn't comprehend the creature before it, 
I tender a small smile. When our glances cross, they may feel foolish, perhaps very human, and there we are on even ground. Uh, I was, um, had the, the amazing opportunity to be at a singing um, weekend with Isai Barnwell, who was one of the members of Sweet Honey in the Rock, an amazing African-American women's chorus, and uh, met up with an old friend there, and this was what came out of that meeting, Oak and Joy. At the choral meet, I stand next to Oak. We fold back beige pleats at a window to see the broad sun of September. She tells me her cancer's lesson was joy. Uterine cancer looked bad. She arranged her affairs, as doctors advise, as if that word could hold the splay of life inside it. She was reprieved, clean margins. She began next morning to inhabit the life she had. She tells me, now I make my coffee and go out and visit the flowers and bees and grass, and there is joy and I let it in. A cute happiness for Oak, but I am chagrined by this week's running hustles to work, past wasps at their apples, quiet shouts of morning glories, wet silver in the unmowed grass, clouds torn from each other. As we begin to sing scales, I see that in naming these things, I received what was essential, which is the calling of joy. Okay, we're in sugaring season, so here's some sugaring poems. Sap icicles. Along Bostwick Road, cold wind froze sap from just pruned maples sideways. I saw a chickadee at an icicle tip, so I stopped driving and put my tongue to the cold tears of the tree. I tasted flint, maple steam when it first rises off the pan. I tasted the shimmer of life pulsing up inside the cool gray bark. As soon as the sun begins to apply those long, warm hands. The happiest child was tongued to that tree. The saddest child grieved the lost limbs. And together we grew up inside my black quilted coat and became this white haired woman who cared nothing for the cars who slowed and stared. <laughs> so it isn't spring to me unless I have my head over the evaporator pan at Doug Bragg's um, sugar house in the, in the, when you just can't see a thing. And so this is, uh, we were there one day uh, and he just visiting and he brought out these letters that his great, great grandmother had written about what it was like to grow up and do this. And so uh, it starts with an epigraph um, uh, from those letters. Grade B. We had a nice warm day on the 24th and some farmers got out their tubs and tapped the trees. Then yesterday was one of the worst of the winter. It snooed and blewed furiously all day, 12 inches of snow. Hurrah for old Vermont. Today is warm again, and the maple syrup is running. A letter from March 26, 1909, by Doug Bragg's great-great-grandmother, Anna Bixby Bragg. Spring does not begin in my body until my head is over Doug Bragg's evaporator. Steam around us like a creature. Warm, pussy willow gray, hinting sweetness as sap laps along the pans. One day when March was coming apart out in the muddy yard, I entered the sugar house and could not make Doug out. Just heard the thunk of thick wood into the boiler, saw a suggestion of his flannel shirt near the orange maw. When he took a break, to ring up my bottles of grade B, we visited a bit. 
and he pulled out a sheaf of letters. Anna's writing elegant and cramped, lining out the vagaries of the season, all that tapping and hauling, the hunkering alongside the boil, however long it took. The season all sweat and shiver like the flanks of the Belgians that stood up burly and patient. Hurrah for old Vermont, she exclaims, and a memory skids in of my grandfather pouring Vermont made on his jello. <laughs> his soft boiled egg, his ice cream, and telling us how they used to boil eggs in the sap on the farm, just over the border, the one he left with $17 jammed in a pocket when he was 17. When I brought him the good stuff after living here for a while, he smiled and showed his small square teeth. Held out the hand known to pigs and later hammers. Très bien, he said. We got out spoons and we tapped that jug. And we did not talk, but hummed a little. <laughs> so this series of poems really is inspired by my students. So I drive to um, uh, Hope Lodge, which is right below Fletcher Allen Hospital, uh, twice a week, and I have come to confront my impatience, which I didn't really want to realize that I had, which this poem addresses. Slow car. <laughs> Yesterday, a rusty bumper white sedan kept a steady 30 in the 35 zone. <laughs> Instantly, impatience frothed like sour foam in the mouth of a bitted horse, chafing to be sooner to the classroom to set out tin cups of color pencils and little trays of paint, the push to be early as red as an ambulance. This urge to overtake is not new. I would never admit the toxic rush of how it feels to pass on the double yellow line. <laughs> At the corner where I expected the car to turn, as most unhurried cars do, reluctant to climb the hill to the sprawl of hospital and what waits there, it kept going straight along, and I saw two furred triangles prick over the back seat listening to invisible words from its human. The hurry drained away. All ill will for the white car flipped to grace, like a big-shouldered angel put her hand on mine and kept it there until exasperation slowed and steadied and got the hell out of the way. <laughs> So um, even though I live in a, a, a tiny place compared to where I used to live, there's still plenty of nature adventures, and this is called Squirrel, comma, Rescue. Gray squirrels have been systematically disassembling the suet feeders. One completely gone, another with its green metallic chain inexplicably uncoupled. So I fixed it, put in a fresh cake of suet, when I returned at noon, one of the greys dangled, hind ankle wedged hard in the notch of the feeder. On went heavy gloves, a jacket just shucked off, boots. I said, I'm here to help you. It replied a gravelly hiss. I reached out and pushed up, squirrel, hand, or tangled royal, suddenly squirrel high in the air, twisting cat-like, landing paws out on a cedar. Nearby, my heart was quiet, a shimmer in the place where we met, where the me flickered out for an instant, rescued from its invisible, shuddered knowing. So there's a bit of a bird theme for the next two. Wren in the storm. Watching the snow split and shriek around the back of the house, something small flitted out from the heart of stacked Adirondacks. Long bill, tail tilt, Carolina Wren. Cinnamon feathers held snug to the body, even as a gust splayed its tail and it tightened in place 
need and danger in balance as the snow spiraled. A wide whirl it peered at, leaned into, vanishing to the place my hunger would never lead. What birds know. What if we were never asked to be this ligamented scaffold of bones and red muscle, organs and their actions of plus and minus? I would be a bird for sure if I was loosened from being human or even in this body, watch them more closely, like last night's massive murder of crows on the campus, perching, roosting, and leaving vast traces of black in the city-lit night. What if the soft copper breast of this winter robin peering in from the sleeping branch of the tulip tree kept me company enough there on the shoulder of imagination? It would mean that last week, as I sat trapped at my mechanics, the wife and then the daughter migrating in to air their worn complaints about stupid everything, I could be rocked back in the gray, grease-stained chair, graceful for the chatter, grateful for the chatter of their ruffle-feathered company, how it reminded me of old relatives chewing the day in my grandmother's kitchen. I would see how beneath all the blue jay jeering, they were both as kind-hearted as new, soft, anticipatory nests. So uh, this is a poem I wrote in honor of a dear, dear student who uh, was an incredible inspiration and quite serendipitously, I happened to be with her the day before she died and then the day she died. Uh, in the room at the hospital and there was some absolute wonder about it and some very disturbing um, questions that came up for me. And so this is called Death Questions for David. Cindy was propped up and gasping. Shallowing breaths, then none. Her eyes flew open, then closed last spark flaring before it went out. What happened next was not tidy. She gurgled. A nurse lunged in to shout, it's all right. The sister and neighbor gripped her modeling hands like beggars. I want to savor the awe part, but after I am home, I can only replay the ugly. The anguish is red and black. It forces two jagged questions. Is there a place or is there nothing? After I dangled from cancer's recurrence in 1998, I crafted a piece with this. Beyond death was an open stone placed at the center of knowing, a door I had the key to, a skeleton key that worked on any lock. Death was just this opening out, now not knowing, and the fear dark and hard. One night, as David drove me home from meditation class, I asked him, what happens when we die? My seeds of doubt frantic like something filmed over time and speeded up, all spindly and awry. He took a breath said he believed we were interconnected with everything. Matter became matter of a different sort. All these strands of energy threaded among and between us. As snow sparked in the headlights, what he said became remembered. In David's red car, misgiving moistened and grew green. Last Sunday, we celebrated Cindy. At 84, Meredith's shaky arms opened to make a circle. In Parkinson hesitant speech, she assured us the circle was large enough. There was always a hand reaching through. 
So this last piece is part of a memoir I am endlessly writing uh, uh, that uh, is about coming to terms with difference and, um, and my relationship with my mother. It's called Lovely Apples. It begins with an epigraph by Linda McCarriston from a poem called The Apple Tree, and here's the lines from that poem. More beautiful now than ever you were, you stand past use, past prettiness in the winter of your winter. In the forest, color is coming, and every breath or so, a leaf releases and parts, ticking through the tenuous lives of other leaves. In the distance, the head of an aspen quivers, stills. I see the smooth wastes of beech, crackled birch, the striated skin of fir and hemlock. This is not a domestic place, although a metal spoon in a white handle lays bowl down in a nearby midden. It's far to the north of the apple tree that shed blossom and fruit in our urban backyard, and where my mother, young with purpose, filled her apron with small mahogany apples to peel, cook, and sieve, rotating the wooden pestle inside the long tin cone. Her applesauce was a little too sweet and short-lived. I do not remember many years of spooning it warm, but then everything telescopes for children, the labor of mothers reduced to spoonfuls. My mother banked on pretty. Her apron bow hung neat and lipstick ringed the filter tips of cigarettes she held I later learned like Betty Davis. She kept jewelry in small white cardboard boxes fixed with rubber bands, the words rhinestones or gold pins written on the covers in black ballpoint ink. In the next door down, she kept underwear organized in plastic bags, the panties, the bras, the girdles, the slips separated by color and fanciness. As a child, I went through my mother's drawers often, sliding my hands between the slippery bags lifting out and opening the boxes. She kept the special black underwear at the back of the drawer, slips with lace and bras that hooked in front. I knew to replace them exactly. Like her underwear drawer, my mother arranged beauty carefully, taking it on and off with care and Pond's cold cream. It was not something I realize now that she ever felt she owned, but was something to be purchased carefully labeled and preserved. I imagine this is what she wished to impart to me, purchasing and patting on the thick makeup that hide to hide my birthmark, researching treatments that caused more pain than erasure. My mother could not fathom why I would want to live with marks exposed, why I would want to suffer so. When I came out to her 31 years ago over a limp salad in a mediocre restaurant, she told me I'd always been a masochist of the first water. <laughs> first the birthmark, and now this, another reason for people to taunt me. Her mouth was stiff with these words. Her fork set down on Formica with a sharp clack. Recently, I looked up the term first water. It is the initial water poured off after soaking wild foods. It is poisonous. When she died, shortly after turning 85, her facelift had given way. Before she died, in photographs that fall and summer, she raised her eyebrows so that the skin around her eyes would look less loose. My sisters and I always puzzled about the look of surprise. <laughs> of glee that was belied in the truth of a smile that merely lifted her lips over capped teeth until she died and we figured out what it meant for her to have her picture taken when she hated her face, her body. My mother did not think she was ever priceless. Her body was no longer of beauty use. The night before my mother took her life, I helped her take a shower. I told her I cherished her saggy belly's beauty, the still shapely calves, her shoulders grooved by bra straps. She was embittered and would not hear of it, 
angry that she'd been forced to move to a new apartment by my father. My father, who compelled to upgrade, underestimated the toll it would take on my mother as she struggled to find a purchase with a memory that was increasingly perforating. The price it would take. My appreciation of my mother's loosening body did my mother no good. My appreciation slid off her waterproof skin like drops that escaped the towel, like tears her skin was shedding. To see my mother naked was a privilege, her body like McCarriston's apple tree past use, past conventional beauty use, past nourishing the hungry gaze of some men and the lure of advertising youth. I cannot help but think of the exasperation I feel when anyone extols the virtues of Shel Silverstein's The Giving Tree. The tree in this book is female and she steadily gives of herself to the needy and clueless man until, old and unsteady, he sits his old bones on the stump of her. She has given everything that made her alive to the man, and now he sits on her stump, past use. My mother did not have roots enough to fathom, toweling off her bitter drops, that she was more beautiful now than ever you were, past prettiness in the winter of your winter. My mother had no receptor site for the distinction between pretty and beauty, the first being what many men see, the latter a loveliness that lives above, below, and beyond skin, makeup or not. Once, years ago, the summer I returned to my family after the first round of cancer, I asked my mother to go swimming with me in the warm August ocean off the south shore of Cape Cod. As we paddled about, touching the ridges of sand with our feet and looking at our hands in the clear, salted water, I urged her to take off the top of her bathing suit. The beach was deserted late in the day and golden lit. I'd been talking to my mother a little about feminism, about the rights of women to love their bodies as is, about how good it might feel to float freely, about who cares. My mother looked at me, bit her lip, and then she did it, slid down one strap and then the other, flipped over the stiff cups of the bodice. Our breasts bobbed just below and just above the surface like lovely apples. I swirled and she swirled. We laughed out loud like we were getting away with something. 